Coming up on Theater Talk. We're all reporters. Oh, we're going to turn on you. And you're the publicist. We're all going to turn. Yeah, start interviewing you. <laughs> do, do you guys like us? Or Ooh. do you just put up with us? Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> Michael. Oh, uh, the truth is, it, is this therapy? <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. So, Susan, we've just had uh, the 69th annual Tony Awards. Was it? A few surprises. We're going to uh, slice and dice the Tonys, figure out the importance, what it all means. But, and and, and we're going to talk about your fabulous predictions. Oh, yes. Once again, what? spot on. <laughs> right. Wrong. Uh, our, oh, so our, wrong. Our panel, my good friend Stephanie Cohn of the Wall Street Journal. Welcome to Theater Talk. Thank you. Paul Wontorek, the editor-in-chief of Broadway.com. Welcome, Paul. And... Our distinguished guest, a friend of mine for going on 25 years, I hate to say Oy. it, a Tony Award winner himself, Adrian Brian Brown, one of the great, great Broadway publicists who received a Tony Award for services rendered, for excellent. lying on the spot. Thank you, what? thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, we'll start with you, Paul. Uh, so I predicted, as many people did, that an American in Paris was going to win Best Musical. Right. Uh, it's $1.3 million a week at the box office. It's going to have a big tour. It's really the big hit of the season. But it was toppled by Fun Home, a fine show, critically acclaimed. But, yeah. I mean, it's about a lesbian teenager and her in-the-closet father who kills himself. I mean, not exactly your typical Broadway fair. What, what do you think happened there? You know, if we looked at it a year ago when Fun Home was having its you know, acclaimed run off-Broadway, I think we all kind of knew it was a front-runner going to Broadway. We knew that critics loved it. We knew that it was uh, acclaimed and, and such an original voice. Mm -hmm. And I think that as the season kind of went on, we saw these big Broadway musicals come along that felt maybe a little more like Tony winning Best Musicals, right? I mean, American in Paris, like you said, it's a beautiful, uh, big Broadway smash with dancing. And for Fun Home, I was split on it. And, you know, at Broadway.com, we're very safe with our predictions. We do a group prediction, so I, so I don't have my name on it anymore. But. Unlike me, I'm out on the limb yes. on my own. Yes. Sawing it year. off. Our group prediction did say an American in Paris. But the minute the show started, I knew it was Fun Home. You know, when you look at, like, Sidney Lucas' song, Ring of Keys, I mean, come on, there's never been a song about a little lesbian girl meeting her first butch. I mean, it's like the most original <laughs> thing ever. But the kid is extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, oh my God. she is adorable. I know you. There'll okay. be kids all over America doing that part now. Oh, stop. No, no. I just think that, that it was a show that had, the campaign made total sense. It knew exactly what it was from the beginning. It had the identity from the year before. Yeah. And, and it just, everything just fell into place that it was the one that was going to be blessed. Sometimes you think, Stephanie, that, you know, you feel a show like American Paris, you hear rumblings underneath, oh, people don't really like it very much. You kind of can detect a backlash. I didn't pick up that up. I mean, I think no, voters genuinely elegant, like American. It's classy. But the one thing that I did hear was it's not really broad. It's a ballet. It's not really traditional Broadway. That was the only. And thing it's I based ever heard. on a movie, and perhaps. But it was such an original, original adaptation. Yeah. It wasn't the traditional, you know, just make a musical out of a movie. It is not about what American in Paris wasn't. It's about what Fun Home was, right. a, a stirring, moving, wonderful work. Adrian, you represented two musicals. Neither last one night. was Fun Home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you have a sense? You know, something rotten you represented in yeah, American Paris. I, I, since this is not going to win, so we're just going to put on the best production number we can and sell as many. Yeah, yeah, no, I, we don't. We become blinkered when you're marketing it. You have to, you, you take the Kool-Aid or drink the Kool-Aid. And, you know, I, yes, in, in my mind I felt Fun Home certainly has the edge and, and is looking to be there. But, yes, you look for ways to use the moment, to exploit the moment. So that it was great that something rotten had the opening number. Yeah. I mean, it positioned well. It's great that particular song was the opening number. It, it sort of led into what the evening could be. So I, I think we, as publicists, just look for those opportunities. So are you in on that process, getting at the opening number? Yeah, in the, the sense we harangue and we we. <laughs> <laughs> You're on the phone we, with we, Les Moonves saying, well, we uh, demand something we, we, rotten. We, we, no, we, we go on with the, um, the Tony <laughs> producers and do that. But this year was, was a very unusual year in that there were three, dare I say it, very, very good shows. And a fourth that was brilliant in its own way. And, and so there, the were no, there were no real duds in there. I am a bit cynical about the business. And I've 
been here a long time and for a many, bit. <laughs> for, <laughs> we'll get to that in a moment. We'll get to hold hold your fire, Adrian. Um, there was a time where I felt that the Tony Award voters were always because Broadway was struggling for so long, always voting for the big juggernaut. Right. So it was into the woods. We'll give Stephen Sondheim the score and James Pine yeah. book, but we're going to give the Tony to Phantom of the Opera because we want shows like that. Now Broadway has made 1.3 billion dollars last year. 13 million people saw a show. Every theater is full. It's never been more robust. Is it possible that voters feel, you know, we can now vote our sentiment, our hearts, if you will, rather than vote the old cynical pocketbook? So you can give it to Fun Home because American Paris is going to be just fine at the box office. Anything to that? I think that's definitely what's happening. I think people are, are voting for the finest work of art or the, the musical that they feel like is moving the form forward. And it's, it's not about the big, the big crowd-pleasing show. And absolutely, it used to feel that way. I mean, I always remember that Into the Woods Phantom year. Yeah. I felt that was like, that felt like when I was a kid, that was like one of those big years that sort of defined that. Yeah. Um, I love Something Rotten, by the way. I mean, that show, to me, I, I was so entertained by that show. That, to me, was like the top entertainment for me. Stephanie, <laughs> another surprise, at least to me, was I thought for sure Kristen Chenoweth, that indestructible musical comedy force, <coughs> was going to topple poor little Kelly O'Hara yeah. for the sixth time she was up for a nominee. But Kelly pulled it off. What do you think happened there? I know everyone that I spoke to thought that Kristen Chenoweth was just... For a, she was really um, energetically sort of working the program for yep. the whole month, yep. just being cute and fun and just, just wanting to win. And that the part was just so perfect for her and, and that the way that they were going to kind of deal with both of them was give the King and I the Musical Revival Award and then and give, give Kristen, her... And yeah. And a lot of people said they thought Kelly O'Hara, it's true, she's almost too perfect. You know, it doesn't see, it's not very emotional in some ways, the way Kristen's just so, like her whole heart is like on the stage, so... Um, but everyone said, you know, it's, that's the big race because they're, they're both so great and so beloved. Do you think it was just because people felt, listen, Kristen has it before, she'll probably win again, and Kelly's never had it, so we'll go that way? Kristen's had a weird run with the Tonys. You know, she won a Tony so early in 1999 for, for Charlie Allie Brown. Brown. yeah. And then, you know, she didn't get nominated for The Apple Tree. It was a very acclaimed performance in Promises, Promises, maybe less acclaimed. Um, Quite a bit less acclaimed that one. <laughs> I, Kristen trying to be vulnerable is not something that works. Well, very well. I thought she was brilliant when she got <laughs> all pouty and, and, and oh, that was good. She that was, was so so smart. Next. Plus a special anniversary performance from the company of Jersey Boys. Very quickly before we get into the history with Adrian, uh, your uh, your take on the show itself. How did Kristen and uh, Alan Cumming do as hosts? And uh, the ratings are down. Did yeah, down significantly? I heard it was the lowest ratings ever. No. 25% down. I, heard in the, it was the I, th I think it's in, in sort of key mark, sorry, key demos, I think it's down like 25% and about 9% overall. overall. Was there basketball yeah. on? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 But what did you think of the show? I had a great time. I, I, I love Chenoweth and Cumming uh, as co hosts. I, I don't know. I, I, like, I like their warmth. I like their humor. I, I liked um, the get ups. You know, sometimes, like, I can't list off any of the things Hugh Jackman or Neil Patrick Harris did as hosts, but I'll, I'm never going to forget Christian Chenoweth in an E.T. costume. I said, fun home. <laughs> Did we watch some of it before I came here? And you are you know, a she'll, just, <laughs> she'll just throw, uh, you know, she'll yes. just try the most random jokes and try to get a laugh and chuck a vaudevillian in that way. She, and, very much so, yeah. I understand why it, it makes it less mainstream, you know, to not have a big star, but it felt a little less cold this year to me. Sometimes in recent years, it's been like it's just a cavalcade of random Hollywood people wandering out on stage and presenting things. And it's just kind of like, what are you doing here? And this year, I didn't feel that. So I appreciated it. Well, what did you feel about the show? You and, you and I sat through some of it in the theater. I, um, I bailed after a while to get, a, to get dinner. <laughs> it seemed very kind of... What was like a star... What was an exciting moment? Other than I know you were excited by the E.T. E e costume. The most fun <laughs> thing I can remember was um, Kelly O'Hara doing her little jig, yeah. which was adorable. But mm -hmm. other than that, like no one even got played off. No one went on too long with their speeches. Like nothing. There weren't enough right. tears. I do, I like, I do like, I do like big emotions. Yeah, there was no. Yeah. I got oh, a so chill sweet. from the Thank Bruce so Bechtel tie. This is Bruce Bechtel's tie that his son Christian gave to me to to share with all of you. That was yeah. lovely. All right, Adrian. Um, we're trying to turn you for the history. Uh oh. Uh, what was the very first Tony Awards you worked as a? Uh, uh, as a the, press the first one I worked was uh, 1985, which was the uh, Big River one. And, and that was an example of a show that was, you know, we were a passionate crew, but it was not beloved. No, it wasn't. You know, the critics were kind of sniffy on it. Yeah. But I think it was a really, it was a very tricky year. There were a lot of not very good shows around. And so it did a sweep. I can't remember how many it won, but it was like, it did a lot. Yeah. And there wasn't even a category that year for leading actor in a musical. It was such wow, a poor how, year. Wow. 
Wow. You know, so dark years. Dark years. Yeah. And and so it was in the Schubert Theater, which is like sixteen hundred seats. Mm -hmm. And and part of the strategy of the producers who had shows nominated is in those days you could buy tickets at like thirty bucks in the balcony. <laughs> so you'd buy as many as you could, so you'd have a cheering, rooting crowd in there. <laughs> because they figured that that would sort of drive the energy of the, the show. Right, right, right. And um, Alex Cohn would let that translate to the television <laughs> audience. And we have to remember Alex Cohn was the legendary producer of the, of right. the Tony Award. Yeah. And were you ever around when he used to, uh, it was before my time, but when just before they would go live, he would start rearranging the seating from the stage? Oh, yeah, no, no, totally. No, it's, <laughs> it's, what, what, it's what, was, what was that like? He was a really hands-on presence yeah. um, in that he was in the room. He was basically shaking hands and turning away people who weren't wearing proper tuxes. And he was absolutely so a master of the room. Mm -hmm. um, and his wife, Hildy Parks, used to write the material. Right, right. And, and it was always, there was, there was a parody Hildy script, which was to always try to contextualize things about what was happening in current affairs. <laughs> so when they were doing a historical retrospective, it would always be, the kids were returning from Vietnam, and back home we were singing. <laughs> and it, it, applause, it, it, applause. You got it. And, and, and you, you, you look at some of these, you look, there's sort of several years where you'd look at these sort of little retro things that were in each show, and it would all be something like really quite major news event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Relating to a Broadway tune. Mm -hmm. And then remember. As it should. I want to ask you, uh, uh, Adrian, do you remember as a kid your, the first Tonys you ever watched? Oof. Were, um, you a, were you a theater geek? Were you watching the I was, Tony Award? I was a movie geek. I became a theater geek, but I was a movie geek. Um, I, it was probably, I do remember seeing Promises, Promises, so that would have been 67. very late, very late 60s. I didn't grow up as someone who had to watch the Tonys. I, and you, but you did, Paul, right? I, oh, my God, yes. <laughs> I, I, I remember... Um, uh, I, I remember very specifically seeing Bernadette Peters sing from Song and Dance. That was wow. the first number I remember, which I That's think great. might have been like 80, it was not the Big River year, it might have been like 86. Yeah. No, I, mean, it I think was, it was the Big River year. year. It could have been the year before. And Stephanie, I, you, did you grow up watching the Tonys? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I did not. I did see Phantom of the Opera, though. When you were, oh, when you were. <laughs> <laughs> so, that call. But you were in like CBS Sunday night, must watch Buick? No, but I did see um, Les Mis. You saw, you saw, you saw <laughs> Those the, are the two things I did theatrically until yeah, as I, a kid. Yeah. As a kid, so. I yeah. want to get into the dynamic since we're all reporters. Oh, and we're going to turn on you. And you are the publicist. We're all going to turn. <laughs> yeah, start interviewing you. <laughs> do, do you guys like us? Or do you just put up with us? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Michael. Oh, oh the truth is, is, is this therapy? <laughs> <laughs> is this therapy? I mean, you know, when the phone rings and it's uh, Michael Wait. Reed on line one, you're like, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> not now. Not just Adrian. <laughs> that way. Oh, it must be about four o'clock on a Tuesday. Need something for the collar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. <laughs> No, but you know what I do? I have or something. The, uh, I have something uh, he might be checking something for a uh, podcast. That's, that's the one. Oh, no, sorry. Checking's the wrong word. <laughs> uh. I mean, do you really think we're all ridiculous No, no. Look, it, listen, it's a, it, it's, this is a horrible cliche, but it is a big family, and it's very synergistic. And, you know, as much as journalists are independent in that they are completely free to think and do what they want, um, the, the system works by having a synergistic relationship. Um, we have tickets and information, yep. and you have papers and cyber to fill. And, and so it becomes like a family. And so we, yes, we get really mad at each other and we do terrible things to each other, but it's, it is ultimately a family that has to work together. I mean, my it's take has always been, it, it can't be personalized, you know. You and I have had our run-ins over shows yeah. and this and the other thing, but that's just the job. Right. And then that's over with, and next season you may have the biggest hit that uh, we want to cheer at Broadway.com right. or the Wall Street Journal. Yeah. I think it'd be too simplistic to think of it as antagonistic that way. Adrian, do you think it's never personalized? It becomes personal because we all become very invested in it. Yes. So, so, yeah. so, it, it, so, and you know, and the relationships we have with the people who make shows or in shows. No, and we also very you defensive. Say, right. So, and and we may know that it's not a particularly good show, and we may know that it has a weakness, but so then you feel bad because you can't do anything about it. But yeah, also, you don't write the shows. Right. When people get some forms of bad press, I just have to say, for you to say it's never personalized. Is it never personalized when they when people are attacked in in Michael's column? It is for the clients, but they also, you know, that's where the hand-holding comes in, and you talk it through, and you say, look, this is, it, it feels personal to you because it's your name, and, and you're being exposed in some way. But you, that's part of the game. Yeah. So you have to you talk them bit. down. Somehow. Yeah, you talk them down. Yeah. But, you know, the good publicist, and Adrian's one of the best, is you have, uh, I think, an open relationship, and you can discuss things. And yeah. a good publicist, I find, never lies. 
if you have the story and it's true, a good publicist doesn't just deny it's it out. No, they don't. They do, an- well, no, I, really? I, 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 but I, that's I, never been your we, your company. We stole and evade. You don't yeah. answer. <laughs> Isn't that true? Do you find Paul that a lot of them just lie outright lie to you? Uh, or yeah, or twist the truth, or <laughs> twisting the truth. I understand because that's part of the job. But and part of and part of our skill has to be to figure that out, right? To yeah, exactly. Out we have to it. untwist the pretzel. And it's all. It's always about asking a very specific, pointed question. If yes. you ask a publicist a very general question, yep. you're going to get burned because they're just going to give you a general. And, you know, they're, 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 they're going to. So you kind of have to know open. the answer before you start. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. You have to <laughs> yeah, know like, what. Like yeah, you wonder where you want to get yeah, to. Yeah. But you know, Michael's yeah. going to come after you if you don't answer at all. No. If somebody has no comment, you've given them the chance to respond. Right. But no comment doesn't mean you're not going to run the story. It means the story is going to appear. We're giving you a chance to respond. I find it's better for the person to respond because, A, it takes up space, physical space. Right. That's That's saying something. And, B, in many instances where you're out to kill somebody, when you have a kind of a fun conversation with them. As one does. Exactly. They can turn turn it around. Yeah. They can make the story. They can totally defang the story. But when you become defensive, then... It just revs up the journalists more. But when you sort of calm them down, when I mean, you then you can help steer it a little bit more. But there are other techniques. I mean, quite often you can be in a situation where for contractual reasons or legal reasons, yeah. you can't respond. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, and then the other sort of low-handed technique is to give it the story to someone else. Um, oh, so but if you, if you, you know. have a relationship with the, with the journalist and say, yeah. contractually, I can't, I mean... That, it, being transparent well, is always yeah, no, yeah. yeah but, but but there's a degree of transparency mm-hmm. oh why can't you tell me why is there a legal problem right. why is there yeah yeah, yeah. You you can't do that. yeah. what was in your uh, career adrian the, the biggest the biggest scandal you've had to deal with um I don't know. I mean, because they... they you, Sunset Boulevard with the but, inflated grosses? But, or, but, <laughs> but, but because part of it is, is if, if you retained all that stuff, you couldn't get up in the morning. <laughs> There's some, been some pretty classic ones where um, there, there was um, a moment when, on a show called I Hate Hamlet, a Paul Rudnick play, oh, yeah. right. where Nicole Williamson attacked Evan Handler, um, and Nicole Williamson was playing... Um, the ghost of John Barrymore. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. And and uh, Evan Handler was playing young actor. And at the end of um, the first act, they have a little sword fight, and Nicole went for it and actually started trying to stab him. Yeah, and smacked him with the sword. I remember yeah. he smacked him and he yeah. said, "Put some life into it, boy." Yeah. And so the papers run the next day. Both the news and the Post had the same picture of, of a duel, which is a handout shot. And I think the Post headline was, "I hit Hamlet." Yep. Um, and so at the time I was actually getting married the day it happened <laughs> <laughs> so I get this call from my office going I really look sorry you know this, uh, and, um, and so you know the, and there's kind of nothing you can do because once those covers run yep. it becomes kind of a global thing because yep. it's, it's so funny and great um, and sad for Evan and, um, and, and that was just about not letting anyone talk to anyone Telling Nicole just shut up, telling Evan to shut up, and just and just writing it out. Right. And of course, it w- wasn't a very good show, wasn't a very well received show, and it closed shortly afterwards. Yeah. And I always use that as an example too of how publicity, um, any publicity, is not good publicity. Right. Mm. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, because ultimately, it, it's it doesn't drive ba- bad, people to buy a ticket. I was going to say bad publicity can raise curiosity, like say in a Spider-Man situation. Right. But no, it just didn't do it. It doesn't drive the tickets, no. yeah. Before we wrap it up, since Paul, Stephanie, our old media, the old newspapers, Paul is new media. Um, what is your feeling now of how you get uh, information out about a show? I mean, when you, when we started, you announced in the New York Times. You took mm-hmm. the big ad out, you had the Friday column, you made an announcement, and that pretty much did a lot of the work for selling. Right. You, you have to be everywhere now. You had to be everywhere, but I think you also have um, so many different ways to do it, depending on what the information is. Mm. Um, if it is, as, say, a show is announcing closing, th- that can be a series of phone calls. Right. Or it can be a posting on Facebook. I mean, th- th- there are so many ways to do it now. Where would you go to, let's say, a Broadway.com with a story as opposed to a story with somebody like me or someone like Stephanie? No, most people will still be a phone call or an email. 
Right. But you would say this is for Broadway. This is oh, yeah, for no, Broadway.com. Yeah, this absolutely. is a better place to be with this information. Yeah. No, I, and it would depend on the nature of the story because, it, you know, the, online you have the capability of interactivity. And so, you know, a story for Broadway.com could be accompanied by a video or right. or right. something that in, in a way that just a, an AP break wouldn't. Right. You're putting it on the Associated right. Press. Right. It's very confusing for everyone right now because we all... You know, you, you see photo opportunities, and we're all taking pictures too and posting them yeah, on social. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so it's it's kind of, I don't know how much it's undermining, but it's it's, we're all spreading the information in a different way. I think. Yeah. Right? I mean, the trick for you, I guess, at Broadway.com, which I think you've done quite well, is you dress the information up with all the extra bells and whistles now, with the videos and uh, podcasting or all the kinds of stuff you have going on on the website. Pod, we don't podcast. Right. That, that's one of those words. That's what the blogs, podcasts, one of those words people I love to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we try to cheerlead every show on Broadway, but to do it in a really interesting way. I, we like to, we're really proud of our video content. Um, we're proud of our news coverage. We're proud of our features, but our photos. We do, we do a lot of different things. Um, but it's funny, when you talk about the, the changeover, like I remember the very beginning, you, we, we launched in 2000. The first four or five, I don't remember when the Friday column actually went away. I would guess... 2004, I don't know, a few years in. But I remember we were breaking news. We were finding out news. And all the publicists were so trained at that point. Like, no, 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 no. It's in the Friday column. It's got to be in the Times. And we were like, well, it's Wednesday morning. We know it. So what do we do about this? And it was such an interesting time because the publicists had to kind of learn to like, and it was like, well, you're going to screw up our whole announcement. If you, you know, it was, it was, it's interesting. And then the Times yeah. took a long time to even get to the point of like, we're going to write news all the time about, <laughs> you know what I mean? That was actually like a huge right, leap. We'd been doing it for so many years before that. So it's definitely, I mean, that was many years ago, but it's still sometimes still feels kind of clumsy and, and producers and publicists are still sort of learning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think they've learned a lot in the last couple of years about new media. I mean, a scoop, who has a scoop anymore? You have a scoop, it lasts 30 seconds, and then yeah, it's, exactly. yeah, it's everywhere right. else. I mean, I still believe it or not, do try to check stuff, but a lot of stuff now gets out there without, you know, in the old days, I would call you, we'd have a conversation, confirm the details, this, that, and the other thing. Now, you're under pressure to put it out as soon as you can. Yeah. Check it later. Yeah, well, and, and, and also something I'm noticing from people who um, report on Twitter a lot is they'll say, breaking news, so-and-so left such-and-such -such a show. You click on the story and they say, story in development. Ah. It's, it's like... Yeah, that's the thing. To get it up right away. To get it up right away. Yeah, before you write the story, you, yep. you tweet it and get so, it out so, there. so that you own the first and the exclusive on it. For 30 yeah. seconds. There's a big value to it, to getting it up. We prep a lot. We, you, if you saw the archive of news stories I that know. we have written, Grim of things that haven't been announced yet, or uh, closings that haven't happened yet. and I mean, we have so many things ready to go. It's the like visit announced today they were closing oh, right. and you know that we all knew that was the I had mine written not shocked by this yeah. mine was written this morning <laughs> and, yeah, uh, yeah mine will exactly. be in my column next week I mean, no, <laughs> right, right. no one's surprised by that so having these things ready and knowing about things and you know and we, we have some like casting things too that we know that we know they're in, are in development and right. so yeah you have to stay on top of it uh, all right Stephanie Cohn from the Wall Street Journal Paul Montork from Broadway.com and Adrian Brian Brown uh, Distinguished Service Tony Award winner. For excellence. <laughs> for excellence. <laughs> Thanks for being our guest on Theater Talk. Thank, Thank you. you. And now, Andrew Andrew for Theater Talk on the red carpet of the 2015 Tony Awards. This year's awards are all about puppets versus puppies and the British invasion of Broadway. Let's find out who wins on the red carpet. There's a lot of Brits on Broadway this season. Are you afraid that they're taking away American jobs? The British are coming, the British... No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, we're so happy to have them. I think they're angry that we won the revolution, and they're trying to get back at us by infiltrating Broadway. You know, as long as they give us jobs over there, I'm happy to have them here. You know, their accents are so charming. Can you do an English accent? Oh, you know, not really. <laughs> I, could, I could f***ing try, though, right? Now, how do you feel about taking away American jobs? I feel great about it. The more American jobs I can take away, the better. I'm, I'm here to ruin America's economy. No, because I'm going to go right over there and take one of their jobs. <laughs> you should play the queen. <gasps> Absolutely not. They can't make margaritas to save their lives. Okay? Like, let Helen make you one. Blech. That's all I'm going to say. Okay, sweet lady, not a mixologist. Broadway and musical theater was created here. So no, I'm not worried about that at all. 
Puppy dogs or puppets? Both. Why, why, why must we choose? Which one's more difficult to work with? <laughs> Both. <laughs> one has a mind of its own, and one, if you have a person like me, has a mind of its own. You know, the puppies, you know, they do that thing. It's so amazing where basically they smear themselves with peanut butter or something, and then the puppy does what you want. Um, I don't think that helps with the puppets. Puppies. Oh, my gosh, puppies. What does that mean? Which one is more difficult to work with, do you think? Oh, puppies. <laughs> but, uh, oh, these corgis, my goodness, they, uh, they have a, you know, a mind of their own. If they don't want to perform, they don't perform. But uh, generally, they're very good. I find they're, much, they're motivated much like actors by the promise of food. <laughs> uh, puppies. Because I'm about to play Sylvia. I'm about to play a dog. What sort of research have you done to be a dog? Me and my dog um, are this summer going to be doing speed and agility classes and obedience courses. Which is worse to work with? Actually, puppets. Can we talk for a second? Like, I love Steve and I love Tyrone, but those two will hold up a rehearsal. Hours upon hours of wasted time just doing shtick. It's like, come on, guys. We got to work. It's a job. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, plus public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night.